Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of, end of the heavens, and its circuit to the ends of them. And there is nothing hidden from, it, from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations, meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. If you'd like to turn with us to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and we'll read verses 14 through 21. Luke 4, verses 14 through 21. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out throughout, through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues and began glor being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as, he, and, a, and as was his custom, he went to the, the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and, recover, and recovering the sight of the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we consider those words that you inspired Luke and the other apostles to write, we ask that that same Spirit will interpret those words to us, that they will plant themselves deep in our souls and in our minds, and that they will grow out into the, the actions that we do in our, in our daily life. And in your name we pray, amen. I thought this was a neat picture of uh, somebody reading a scroll. I say it's Jesus, but you can't see his face. And I don't really know what Jesus' face looks like, but uh, that's probably what it looked like from behind anyway. 
What is the Christian life? This is a question that most of us have struggled with our entire, the entirety of our, our journey of faith. What is a Christian? The, answer to this question, the answers to this question are numerous, as numerous as the number of denominations. It's as numerous as the amount of people that claim faith. It might even surprise you that the answer to that question extends beyond those that believe. Because even those outside of our faith, those that may be seeking or, or those that may be in open opposition, have their own answer to that question. What does it mean to be a Christian? The answer we give to this question has weight. That answer can direct your path and, and direct you in your faith's journey. It can lead us closer to God, and it can also lead us away from Him. The answer we give to that very important question not only <coughs> excuse me, directs us in our own journey of faith, but it also dictates how we live our lives within our community. People see your answer to that question. They see your faith in how you respond to the clerk running the register at Walmart or at Target. They see your faith in how you drive your vehicle on the interstate. It's unfortunate, isn't it? They see your faith in how you study, how you participate in athletic competitions, how you handle stress, and how you speak to those that hold a different opinion than your own. People see the answer to that question. They see your faith. I ask again, what is the Christian life and what does it mean to be a Christian? Faith and action have been something our tradition within the church has struggled with throughout our history. There are cycles in our history. At, time we, at times we focus on charity and at other times, we deepen our understanding of theology. And there are times where we focus on, on procedures and how we do things. And at other times, we're focused on grace. None of these focuses are wrong. In fact, most of those focuses are extremely important. Within every major movement within church, the leaders within those movements notice something within the answer that we gave to that question of what it means to be a Christian that wasn't being expressed fully. They saw something that was being overlooked or something that was being too heavily emphasized that seemed to be overshadowing the gospel. That began to speak out they began to speak out about these things, and they raised awareness of the areas that were lacking. We see this throughout our history. We see it within our various divisions of denominations and religious orders. We see it even among the meetings of worship within our communities. These cycles and divisions tell us something about ourselves. And our answer to that question that we all encounter. This is the history of faith. It has been a struggle from the dawn of time and it will continue to be a struggle when time ends. It is the struggle that began the moment our first parents looked at the tree of knowledge and listened to the voice of, the, of deception. We struggle because we want to have knowledge of good and evil. We want to be the masters of our own destiny. We desire the power to rule. If we were to look at that story of our first parents more closely, we would see that they already had the thing that they desired. God had already given them the power and authority to, to bring all of creation under their stewardship. They did not need anything more than what they already had. Yet they were unable to see the truth that they were living in. 
They were distracted and they turned from the light of their God and were trapped in the shadow of their own making. They began to rely on themselves instead of listening to the voice of their Creator and they allowed chaos to emerge. They turned and yet God remained. They shifted their focus, and even in their movement away from him, God continued to call them back to him. We often look at that story through the eyes of our ancestors. We often see this as the story of the fall. But do we ever really consider the story as a testimony of God's faithfulness? We turned. We were distracted, yet God continued to work. God continued to call his good creation back to him. We see this through the lives of the patriarchs in the history of Israel. We see it in the life of Christ. It is not only a story of humanity's fallen state, but it's, an, it's also a story of God's goodness and his great love. This is where we find today's passage. Jesus in Luke 4 is, is just beginning his ministry. In the verses prior to what we read, Jesus had been baptized and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. The temptation by, by the accuser or the adversary reflects the temptations we all face. They are not necessarily things that we should not have. But we are tempted to obtain those things in ways that could cause harm in some way. Every student wants to obtain a good grade on an exam. That is the, that is the desire, not only for them, but also from their teacher. They all want a good grade. When a student is tempted to cheat on a test, they might, not, they might think to themselves that they're not causing harm. They think that it, it is the desired outcome of all parties, so what harm could come from it? And we might not see the harm, but if we allow this temptation to take hold, if we take the shortcuts to obtain the desired result, we leave behind the opportunity of true understanding. And wisdom. Cheating on a fifth grade spelling test might not seem harmful, but if we allow that behavior to continue, eventually that fifth grade student becomes a graduate student. And if that student is allowed, has allowed that temptation to take hold, they will eventually take that same shortcut into the workplace. They're now the lead engineer in charge, of, in charge of a construction of an overpass on a complex interstate highway system. And they do not understand the principles of engineering because they took a shortcut. They're cheating. They're, they're taking a shortcut to obtain a desired result. Now threatens the safety of millions of people driving to work every morning. We may not see the harm. We may not understand the long-lasting impact of our decisions. I was once that student that cheated on the spelling test. I tried it multiple times. And I'm thankful my, my teachers did not allow that behavior to persist. And I still can't spell if my life depended on it. But I learned better ways. You, you would, I could prove that I can't spell if you looked at my sermon. Sometimes I don't know what I wrote. So, but I learned different ways. Jesus comes back from his trial in the desert, and he returns home. He returns to Galilee and to his hometown of Nazareth. I again want to mention verse 16. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom... He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood to read. Jesus made it his custom to worship at the synagogue. He made it his custom to join with his community for corporate reading of scripture, 
prayer, praise, and education. Jesus gives us an important example of the Christian life in that verse. We need to worship together. It's important not just for our own spiritual life, but for those within our community. I'm a pastor. I need everyone in this meeting house just as much, if not more, than you need me. I need you because you remind me of who God is and who I am before God. You might say that that is what I do for you. And it's because the community of worshipers encourages each other. All of us are important. All of us need to be here to teach one another. This is not the only important thing that Jesus shows us in this passage. He stands in the synagogue and he begins to read from the scroll of Isaiah. This is an, an important passage to the community of believers. It speaks of deliverance, recovery, liberty, and opportunity, and redemption. This prophecy was written prior to the exile of the people of Israel, and it speaks of the return not just of the tribe of Judah, but of all of Israel. It is their desired future. It is, it is a proclamation of God returning his people back to their rightful place. But there's a problem. The people in Nazareth love this passage. It gets them excited. It speaks to the condition of their heart. They are a people that identify as being poor because they are living under the rule of, and dominion of others. They see themselves as captive because they don't have the liberty to live their life the way that they would like. They see themselves as oppressed. They see themselves in this passage, and they are excited to hear those words because it gives them hope. The problem is there's more to these verses. The first words recorded by Luke in Jesus' public ministry begin with the prophet's words from Scripture of a spirit-filled Redeemer that will set all things right. Jesus reads these words, and he rolls up the scroll, and he returns to his seat. Everyone heard what was said, and they look at him in expectancy. Why do they look? Why are they staring at Jesus? What are they wanting to hear? They're used to hearing these words of redemption, but usually they're coupled with the declaration of vengeance of God for those that are oppressing the people of God. Jesus doesn't go there. He instead rolls up the scroll and hands it back to the synagogue ruler to be put back in the cabinet that they keep the scriptural scrolls, and he sits down. They look at him in expectancy because Galilee was filled with zealots, Galilee is filled with people ready to jump into action. The Jewish wars, which resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, are said to have begun in this region. These were people filled with righteous zeal, ready to use whatever means necessary to bring about the world that they desired. Yet Jesus doesn't speak about the vengeance of God. He doesn't encourage the people of God to take up arms or to take forceful action against those that oppose God. He speaks only of proclaiming the good news to the poor, liberty to the captive, recovery to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, and the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is telling us something important in this selection of verses. By not proclaiming the vengeance of God, he is opening this blessing up to all people. These, these words are, are not just for one people group or nation. These words are extended to all. And when he sat down with all the eyes on him, he says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
In Luke's account of the gospel, the first sermon Jesus gives is one sentence. Don't you wish your pastor would do that? One sentence. And within that sentence, we are told what it means to be a Christian. We are to take part in the bringing of hope to the poor. We are to participate in the granting in, in granting freedom to those that have been living under bondage. We are to provide care to those that have been struggling through illnesses. We are to provide relief to those that are living under a systems of oppression. We are to proclaim that God is for all people. I have often made mention of the holy rhythm of Christ. I have said that this is the rhythm of life that we all should participate in, and I have even shown how this is in our own mission statement and how that reflects that rhythm. Jesus' rhythm of life is to withdraw to the isolated places to pray, and he made it his custom to worship within his community and to minister to the needs of those around him. Our mission statement says that we are a people loving God, embracing the Holy Spirit, and living the love of Christ with others. We love God by making it our custom to worship together. We embrace the Holy Spirit by withdrawing to pray in our own time and making sure that the that communion with God, with the Spirit is important in our lives. And we live the love of Christ with others when we listen to that spirit through, through our prayers and our worship. And we see areas where we can minister and bring hope to the poor or relief to those that are oppressed. When we speak and act in, in those areas, we are participating in the ministry of Christ. And our ministry is to participate in those words that Jesus read in Scripture. These words are the mission that God gave our first parents when he told them to be fruitful and to multiply and to bring all the earth under their dominion. That first mission was to make the entire earth into the Garden of Eden, the place where God would dwell. We were to take the image of God out into the world and to become his representatives to all the earth. That mission has not changed. Our mission remains the same from the dawn of time. We are still to bear the image of God to, a wor to the world around us. We are to bear the light of God in the darkness. The problem is we're tempted to take shortcuts. We're tempted to use our knowledge to force those around us to submit. We're tempted to focus on the knowledge of evil instead of the knowledge of good. And we do this because our attention is distracted. We forget that we must bear the image of God. Who is God? What is God? What are we bearing? Is God the instrument of vengeance? Yes, he can be. But that's not the whole story. Is God love and grace? Again, yes. But this is also not the whole story. God is who he is. He is the creator of all things, seen and un unseen. He wa God watches as the, watched as the unseen things rebelled against him and distracted the things seen from him. God had every right to act out in anger and to devastate his creation, but that is not what God did. God will not suffer open rebellion against him, but he also will give every opportunity for us to return to him. That is why Jesus came. That is why we celebrate and worship his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. 
We celebrate this because God came to us so that we could be restored to our rightful place. So that we could be freed from the oppressions of our own making. And Jesus calls us to participate in that continued mission. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive, and recovering the sight of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Is it today? Will we live this out in our homes, in our schools, in our places of business, in our halls of justice, in our churches, and in our lives? Is this today? Let us now join together in open worship and communion in the manner of friends. And if the, Lord, if the Spirit is speaking to you, then please share. But let us enjoy the presence of God together. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you do meet with us and you encourage us and you call us to reason with you and to participate in a conversation. And then you send us out into the world that we live and you encourage us to be bearers of your image. Lord, as we see the things going on around us, I pray that we won't be gripped by fear or the knowledge of evil, but instead we'll look for the good and speak into the good and encourage the growth of your light in the darkness. For those that aren't with us, that are are mourning the loss of family members and friends, we ask that your comfort will be on them. For those that aren't with us in illness, we pray that you will bring healing. And for all of us, we pray that you will open our eyes so that we can see the world around us in the way that you see it, and that we can participate in the ministry that you have called us to. And in your name we pray. Amen. The Spirit of God is upon you and has anointed you. You are the salt of the earth and you bring light to the world. You are not too young or too old, are not too rich or too needy to bring good news to the impoverished, to give a hand to the brokenhearted, and to live out freedom and pardon through the gifts you have been given. So remember to pack peace in your toolbox, hope in your briefcase, and love in your lunchbox. And may integrity, honesty, and joy be your designer wear of choice. 
Do not be frightened, for you are never alone. The God in whose image you are, are made will walk with you and guide you today, tomorrow, and every day. Amen. 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 Go in peace.